Okay, advanced procrastinators, how are you guys doing today? We are going to do another version of my civil rights lectures online. This is civil rights part two, late 1950s and early 60s for my students. Now, our focus learning target today is given that African Americans have been denied equal rights since the end of Reconstruction 1877, we're examining again how the civil rights movement in the 1950s gained traction. And today we're looking at the number of people involved increasing. As well, we will be looking at how the actions that were taken by the protesters, though you'll see how risky they were to those involved, forced the federal government and the white population of the United States to take notice and recognize the demands of civil rights protesters. And for my students, this will be demonstrated by answering the blue guiding questions and a short response question. Now, for those listening, the way I have my students do notes is in your notebook, write only use Cornell notes and write only the notes that are in red on the right side and all notes that are in blue are questions to be answered. My students will be writing their answers on the left side of the notebook and then afterwards on a Google Doc, they will be transcribing those answered questions in their Google Doc. But also essential questions to ponder, do not worry about having to answer these, but think about these. Number one, make sure you can identify and define all of these terms. Sit-ins, freedom riders, James Meredith, letter from a Birmingham jail, 16th Street Baptist Church, Birmingham's Birmingham Children's March, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Selma, otherwise known as Bloody Sunday, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Explain how the actions by civil rights protesters are being successful in swaying public attention to support their cause, and evaluate if you feel the government was supportive of the federal rights movement. So let's get into this. Now, the first question is this, if you could have been a part of the civil rights movement, what is something you and your friends could have done to protest and bring attention to the injustice of segregation? How could you have been involved in the civil rights movement as an ordinary regular person? Stop the video and answer that question, please. Okay, well, let's see how ordinary younger people could have been involved in the civil, civil rights movement. So what I want you to do next is watch the following video, video and answer the two questions below. So you can open up a new tab and type in how a lunch counter sit-in became an iconic civil rights moment or the YouTube address on the right and answer the next two questions. Identify a sit-in and explain the danger associated with this type of protest. And number three, analyze why this type of protest was so effective in pointing out the hypocrisy and unfairness of segregation. So stop the video now, open up a new tab, and type that in and watch the video, please, and then answer the questions. Okay, welcome back. Let's talk about what a sit-in is and what happened at Greensboro, North Carolina, which is the site of the first sit-in. Now, the four gentlemen that you see in the upper left-hand corner were the originators of the sit-in. They were four college students who went to North Carolina A&T and inspired by Rosa Parks and her act of defiance by sitting on the front of the bus thought what can we do ourselves so they thought we can set a lunch counter at Woolworths now what's the deal with a lunch counter at Woolworths well a lunch counter is very much like you might see at Denny's today where you can walk up and sit right at the counter but the difference was these lunch counters were inside of pharmacies or small mom and pop shops and back then before there was fast food there was no mcdonald's in the south there's no jack in the box or things like that what people would do is they would eat their lunch a quick fast lunch inside a shop just like cvs so what you could do is walk up to the lunch counter literally order your food and do your shopping and by the time you were done doing your shopping your food would be sitting for you at the lunch counter you could eat your food and be on your way very quickly now the problem with the lunch counters at a woolworths was the fact that if you're African-American, you could go and shop at the Woolworths. They'll take your money for school supplies, toilet paper, pharmaceutical goods, anything like that. But you are not allowed to sit at the lunch counter. So that was an obvious overt type of segregation saying you're good enough to spend your money in our shop, but we don't want you sitting and staying in our shop very long. So these four gentlemen basically sat down and ordered a cup of coffee. The waiter came up and said, what are you doing here? We just like a cup of coffee. Woolworths closed the shop that day. Not the shop, but they closed the lunch counter. The next day, they came by and they did the exact same thing. So basically, just by this act of civil disobedience, right? they could 
impact the business, the day-to-day -day business of the pharmacy or the Woolworths. Now, another thing you could do if you want to do it is you could also contact the local newspaper or TV station and say, hey, we're going to do a sit-in at whatever place between these hours. If you want to come and film us, you can come and film us. Newspaper always looking for a good news story would come down and film this. And when these sit-ins would occur, there would be Southern white agitators, usually young people as well, too, who would gather around the protesters, te protesters at the counter and abuse them. They would pour milk on them. They would pour coffee on them. They would pour sugar on them. Whatever was around, they would pull them down. They would beat them all kinds of very, very threatening tactics. Now, this inspired others because it was just so simple. All you have to do is sit down, call a newspaper, and all of a sudden you're part of the movement. By the end of 1960, 50,000 people had demonstrated these pro protests and 3,000 went to jail. Now think about that for one second. 3,000 protesters going to jail for sitting at a lunch counter, whereas the agitators weren't arrested. Now, another question. Imagine this. Imagine we're going to take a bus from California to Florida. Now, remember, the interstate highway system has just been created by Dwight Eisenhower and Interstate 10, the Santa Monica Freeway that starts in Santa Monica, goes all the way from Santa Monica to Phoenix to Tucson to El Paso to Houston to New Orleans, all the way to Jacksonville, Florida. And a lot of people use the interstate highway and buses because it was a, a quick, cheap way to travel. Airplane travel was available at this time, especially through jet planes now, but it was very expensive. So for a lot of people, taking a bus was the simplest way to go. And if you're going to take a bus, it's going to take days for you to get there. So there are going to be stops for people to go to the bathroom, to go get food and get whatever they need to get. Now, when we leave California, there are no segregated facilities. But as you reach the south, white riders are allowed to get off the bus and go inside an air-conditioned restaurant and go to the bathroom and order food and sit down. Whereas minority riders are forced to order their food outdoors, through the back door, uh, and forced to eat on the curb. Now, explain what's particularly unfair about the segregation. So stop the video, answer the question. Okay, so two answers are this. One, there's the obvious answer. It's not fair because when we started, we could all sit down together, and by the end of it, we couldn't sit down together anymore, and segregation is unfair. Okay, yeah, that's obvious. But the underlying issue was this. The real problem is segregation is a state rule. Each state in America at this time could decide if they want to segregate or not. And Jim Crow laws were essentially isolated only to the South. Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, California did not have these laws. And the problem here was we are on the interstate highway system built by Dwight Eisenhower and the federal government. So the issue at hand here is we should be under the jurisdiction of the federal government when we're traveling on the interstate highway. And the federal government does not have segregation or Jim Crow as one of its rules. So when we get off the bus being on an interstate highway, no matter where you are at, if it's next to the interstate highway, we should all be able to access any facilities equally. Now, the group that's going to point out this problem is going to be a group called the Freedom Riders. So I want you to watch the following video uh, from the American Experience, Freedom Riders, the young witness, and answer the questions about the Freedom Riders. Explain the dichotomy, the conflicting attitudes regarding blacks and whites living together in the South. Also, explain why this young woman felt she had to help the Freedom Riders, regardless of the punishment she could have received. Evaluate if more Southerners or whites feel the same. So Stop this video, open up a new tab, watch the American experience, please, and then come back in a couple minutes. <sighs> okay, welcome back. That's a pretty powerful video. I hope you guys watch that, okay? Now, who are the Freedom Riders and what happened here? Now, the Freedom Riders, right, were black and white civil rights advocates, mostly college students, actually, who rode around the South in the buses focusing attention on the segregated interstate bus stops, right? Now, when they got there, these young college students were well-educated, well-spoken, nicely dressed, not a threat to anybody, were met by mobs. One bus was burned, 
Police in the local towns refused to protect the protesters in many cities, like in Birmingham, Alabama. The Klan was waiting for the protesters when they got off the bus and started beating up all the protesters while the police just sat aside because that's the local police. It's not the federal police. And the issue here was these instances that were seen on television, once again, the beatings in Birmingham, and you guys saw the bombing of the bus uh, just outside of the city forced President Kennedy to send the U.S. Marshals in to protect the rioters. Now, here's the important question you need to understand. Number seven, when President Kennedy sends the U.S. Marshals to protect the freedom rider, what new power is getting involved in the civil rights movement that was absent before the 1960s? Stop the video, answer the question, please. Now, the answer is the federal government. Eisenhower is the first U.S. president to do to allow the federal government to get involved when he sent the 101st Airborne in to protect the Little Rock Nine and allow them to go to school. But you're going to see JFK is going to become the first president who's going to get more regularly involved in the civil rights movement as no other president has done before. And JFK, after this moment, is now involved in the civil rights movement, even though you'll see he really didn't want to get involved in the civil rights movement so heavily at first. Now, here's another question. Imagine this, you're accepted into UCLA, but you're told you can't attend because of your race. What is so particularly unfair about this type of segregation at the university level, even more so than segregating public high schools? Stop the video, answer the question, and really think about that. Okay, here's the answer. Why do you go to high school? You're forced to go to high school. What high school do you go to? The one that's closest to me. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, it's just basically you you don't get a choice in your public high school. But getting into UCLA means you had to have the talent in order to get in. You got the grades, you got the SAT score, you passed your AP exams, you earned that spot at UCLA. And UCLA is also a public school, too. It's paid for with state tax dollars. It is the university system for all Californians to be, go to that is affordable and excellent. And the problem with it is, no matter how good you are, no matter how talented you are, no matter the fact that you earned it, just because of your race, you're not allowed to go to that university. And that's what's wrong with it. And that's what James Meredith did. You can see him in the very middle there. Now, James Meredith was an Air Force veteran using the GI Bill to go to university. And he applied to 10 school at all-white University of Mississippi, otherwise known as Ole Miss. And when Meredith got there, the governor personally blocked Meredith from entering the school. Now, when that happened, JFK sent the U.S. Marshals in to protect Meredith and allow him on campus to go to school. When Meredith got into the campus, riots broke out on campus. That resulted in two deaths. Now, the riots were not by black people. It was by white people freaking out about an African-American getting into this university, right? And what Kennedy was forced to do this time was he sent the army in to protect the marshals who were protecting Meredith. Now, here's another question. Why are whites freaking out so much about an African-American going to university? Why are analyzed why whites in Mississippi are so passionate about preventing blacks from attending a public university? Stop the video. Think about that. Now, the answer is this. The reason why, think about you. Why do you want to go to university? Why do you want to go to college? Because if I go to college, I get a good job and I get paid a decent salary. I can move myself up in my ranking in life. I can maybe have a better life than my parents. And by preventing African-Americans from being able to go to any public university or affordable university, what the state of Mississippi is doing is trying to ensure that a whole class of people, a whole race of people is always left doing substandard menial jobs and they'll never have the opportunity to improve themselves because they're never given the education in order to move up in society. That's why white people are freaking out. If black people are allowed to go to university, they actually might become successful and black success, African-American success, some will promote others. Now, that's in Mississippi. Let's talk about Alabama, probably even more segregated and racist than Mississippi. Well, they're both pretty bad. Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, 
it is known as the most segregated city in America and the most racially violent, right? Between 1957 and 1963, there were 18 bombings. And these bombings were intense bombings. The most famous one you can see in the left-hand corner there is the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing uh, in which four Klan members stuck 15 sticks of dynamite underneath the church on a Sunday on a Sunday morning and called to the church and say, you've got three minutes to get out. The 15 sticks of dynamite blew up in just one minute. And you can see in the middle there, Four young girls who were downstairs changing in a bathroom were not able to get out, and they were blown up. This is one of the moments in American history that all Americans uh, empathize with, and it's going to be one of those moments that change a lot of attitudes of white Americans. But Martin Luther King, even before this happened, because it, the reason why the 16th Street Baptist bombing occurred was because Martin Luther King was in Birmingham, and he was agitating for change, right? And it was actually at this church, the 16th Street Baptist Church, that Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders were using as a headquarters. And that's a reason why the 16th Street Baptist Church was targeted, right? Now, one of the tactics of Martin Luther King in Birmingham was to peacefully protest. That's obviously a standard of Martin Luther King, but was to go out, protest, get arrested, um, and then protest again and get arrested again. And then get out of jail because it's like, well, we have more protesters. We've got no room in the jail. Let's have the other old protesters. So it'd be a revolving circle of people in jail. But by 1963, this has been about almost eight years into the civil rights movement. And a lot of people are getting very, very tired of how long it's taken to get equal rights. And Martin Luther King writes a letter from Birmingham jail. And what he's doing is, number one, he's defending the use of civil disobedience, the idea of peaceful protest. Because a lot of people by this time are getting hit in the face and they're thinking, how many more times do I have to get hit in the face? Pretty soon I might be dead. But at the same time, he's also supporting African-Americans saying, we simply cannot wait and hope that the government will make the change. We have to constantly keep risking ourselves and agitating and we cannot stop. Now, what's interesting about this, I always thought was, Martin Luther King is telling black people when they get hit in the face to turn the other cheek. What if blacks turned around and decided to hit back? Imagine this. Imagine if blacks decided to ignore Martin Luther King's strategy of peaceful protest and began to fight back against whites. Stop the video and answer that question. Okay. Well, imagine this. Do black people in the South have guns? Of course they do. It's the South. It's a rural area. Lots of people have guns. It's the Second Amendment. And black people have guns as well as white people in the South have guns uh, in order to hunt or for their own self-protection. So black people and white people in the South are both armed. And if black people were to turn their guns on white people, white people would have turned their guns and you would have literally had a bloodbath happening in the South. The other obvious answer is, you'll see in the other images, is that civil peaceful protests was the one thing that was allowing African-Americans to really point out about who was on the right and who was in the wrong. As long as African-Americans never fought back, they could always say we're being denied our basic constitutional rights of equality under the law. And it's the other group, white segregationist racists, that are the ones that are being on the wrong side. The second blacks picked up a weapon, picked up a brick, picked up a gun, picked up anything and fought back, African-Americans would be the agitators and they'd be seen as being wrong okay so some people were were said king was moving too slow but as i said there'd be blood in the streets now the most famous incident in birmingham is going to be the birmingham children's protest 1000 plus african-american children marched now why are the children marching well as i said earlier all of their parents have been arrested there have been so many protests happening that all the adults are in jail, basically. So the children take it on themselves to get out in the streets, right? And this is when the police attack the protesters. Chief of police, Bull Connor, orders his police to use dogs and the firemen to use fire hoses to break up these protests. And if anyone's ever heard about the, the intensity of a fire hose, right? People say it's like being hit with a sledgehammer, right? Now, these protests were captured once again by television. So what's happening in Birmingham doesn't just stay in Birmingham, it's going out all over to America. And another thing about television that's different 
We only see the images. The people could hear the children screaming as well, too. So you had the images of the beatings and the screaming happening. And Birmingham soon desegregated, and this was a major civil rights victory. So can you stop the video for one moment? Uh, open up the next tab, Black children arrested and assaulted in Birmingham's Children's Crusade, and answer this question. Explain how these images really show the segregationists to be un-American. Think about what kinds of atrocities, what kind of countries or governments you would expect their police to carry out these kinds of atrocities. So stop the video, open up a new tab, and watch the next video, please. Okay. Well, let's look at the answer here, right? What is it about these images that show segregationists to be un-American? Well, because what's the purpose of the police? It's to protect and serve. And here the police with the dogs in the lower left-hand corner are attacking people. How about firemen? I mean, that's that's one group, nobody hates firemen. If you see firemen coming up to your house and your house on fire, you'll say, no, hey, you stupid firemen, I don't like you, go away. It's like, no, thank you for being here. And now the firemen are being put in a position where they're being seen as being militants and that's the thing what kind of countries do you expect to carry out these kind of atrocities where the firemen and the police attack our own citizens how about nazi germany how about china how about north korea right those kinds of dictatorships and totalitarian nations are the nations you expect to use their police to attack our own citizens not the united states of america where the purpose of government is to protect our natural rights our life liberty and property and the entity that's meant to protect those natural rights the police or the firemen are doing the exact opposite here now let's talk about jfk because as i said jfk is the first president responsible for getting the federal government involved in protecting civil rights advocates in the south you saw him getting involved with the freedom riders you saw him getting involved with jeff meredith okay and in the upper left hand corner you can see jfk standing there with martin Luther king on the left right and jfk in conjunction with with martin Luther king is promoting a civil rights bill a bill supported by, sponsored by Kennedy, that would go to Congress to end segregation and protect black voters. This was a key reason for the March on Washington in the first place. A lot of people were afraid that the March on Washington would be too antagonistic and, and might be too, too strong for a lot of white supporters. It could hurt the civil rights bill, but at the same time, a lot of people thought that by having the March on Washington, where 250,000 people were there to support civil rights, it would show a public demand for the government to get involved and end segregation in the South. The problem is JFK's support for civil rights upset many white Southern voters. And you got to remember this, analyze. Why does a Democratic Party why does it have one group of supporters, massive support from African-Americans and the Democratic Party supporting civil rights, but it also has a huge group of voters of white Southerners who are segregationists and racists? Why does the Democrat Party who supports black rights have whites who do not support black rights in the same political party? Think about that for one second. And the answer lies in the fact that white Southerners still remember in the Civil War that it was Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party that freed the slaves. Even in the 1960s, white Southerners still vote Democratic because it was a Republican that freed the slaves. And what's going to happen here, as you saw from your reading, is because of Democratic support of black rights in the 1960s, it's going to cause these white voters to turn over to the Republican Party in the 1970s, right? So the solution for JFK in offending these white voters is he has to go to the South to regain white support. He's trying to make the argument that what I'm doing shouldn't really offend people because it's so unconstitutional that it's just part of progress and I still don't want to lose the white vote in the South. And because Kennedy is in the South trying to, to placate these white voters, that's where he is assassinated uh, by Lee Harvey Oswald, um, from the sixth story of the Texas the school school textbook depository. Now Lee Harvey Oswald's assassination of Kennedy had nothing to do with Kennedy's support of civil rights. But what you need to understand here is this: when Kennedy is assassinated, 
How is his death going to impact the nation regarding civil rights? Stop the video, answer that question. Okay, what happens is this. Unlike President Lincoln when he's assassinated, and he is the one American that wanted to bring equal rights to black people as well too, and he had the support of everybody in America, he's replaced by Andrew Johnson, arguably the most racist president in American history, and it is one of those moments in American history where the government, federal government was ready in Reconstruction to give African Americans equal rights, and the President of the United States was not. Kennedy is replaced by this gentleman, President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, LBJ was a senator before he became vice president under Kennedy, and he was one of the most effective legislators in the history of the United States. In fact, he had something called the Johnson treatment, where you can see in the upper two left-hand corners, he would get in people's faces and he would not stop asking for what he wanted or their vote until he got what he wanted. So he had really strong ties in the Senate and in Congress. Okay? Also, another thing about LBJ you need to recognize, even though he's from Texas, he's from a Southern segregation state, he believed that the government should do more to protect the needy. His political hero, my boy Freddie, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he in fact was elected to the House of Representatives in 1932, the same year FDR came in there. And you really have, as the President of the United States, a champion for the little guy. And the little guy in this case, LBJ definitely believed in ending segregation in the South because he'd seen it in the South. And he uses. The national sympathy that a lot of Americans had when Kennedy died, people don't forget where they were when he died and said, oh, my God. And why did he die? Well, some people thought he's in the South trying to get civil rights. And he's he's a martyr for trying to get this right. So he used the national sympathy and support for JFK's civil rights agenda to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is it. End segregation in public places in the South. Segregation and Jim Crow laws are now done. Drop the mic. Spike the football. We're winning. And a lot of people would say JFK's death was monumental in, in allowing this to happen, as well as happened shortly before the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, were two incidences where Americans said, yes, we support this. We will go through with this. But there's a problem. It ends segregation in public places. I need you to watch this video about John Lewis. Representative John Lewis today, a hero and an icon of the civil rights movement you've never heard about. And watch his video. I thought I saw death. John Lewis remembers police attack on Bloody Sunday in Selma 50 years ago. And just to give you a spoiler alert, in the upper right-hand corner, that's John Lewis laying on the ground. And when you watch the video, it's John Lewis in the trench coat that's at the very front of the line. So identify two tasks that were used for the literacy requirement test. And number 15, identify the purpose of the March at Selma and explain what is unconstitutionally wrong that the police attacked these protesters. This is, 19, this is after the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Segregation's done. Why are people still protesting? Stop the video, open up a new tab, answer the questions, please. Okay. Welcome back. John Lewis is a hero of the United States and someone who should be admired. I hope you guys remembered him. In the chapter Insights, I mentioned his name earlier as he was a member of SNCC uh, and was one of the more radical protesters who wanted to do more than just peaceful protests. But let's talk about what happened at Selma, Alabama. The problem with Selma, Alabama is the Civil Rights Act of 1964 ended segregation in public places, but it did not protect voting rights of African Americans. In Alabama, only 1% of African Americans were registered to vote. And African Americans are half the population. And remember this, 1% registered to vote. That doesn't mean 1% voted. You have to register to vote in order to vote. So the number of voting is actually even less than 1%. So 50% of a population has no political say happening in Alabama. So Bloody Sunday, what you saw was a march engineered by Lewis, right, where the marchers crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in an effort to walk to the state capitol to demand to register to vote. Now, as they peacefully marched to the capitol across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you saw the police beat them down. Now, what's so unconstitutionally wrong about this? Because remember, 
the fifth, 14th and 15th Amendment have already given African Americans and all Americans the right to vote. The 14th Amendment says that you're a citizen of the United States and citizens get the right to vote. And the 15th Amendment says you cannot you you cannot prevent a person from voting based on race. Now, obviously, we know in the South what they did is they never said it was based on race. It was based on a literacy test or it was a poll test. And you saw several of the ways that were used for the literacy requirement is how many bubbles are in a bar of soap, how many jelly beans are in a jar. You know, recite a whole passage of the Constitution of the United States. The requirements for the literacy test were meant to be impossible requirements that just going to never be answered. And Alabama never had to give African Americans the right to vote. So after this attack at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Martin Luther King arrives two weeks later. You can see him in the upper left hand corner, and he finishes the march to Selma, Alabama. And once again, this is on television, and this forced. President Lyndon Johnson, as John Lewis was saying in his speech, he was upset about Johnson being in Vietnam and sending boys over there, but at the same time, not protecting the rights of African Americans in the South. And the Voting Rights Act of 1964 5 is passed, and this gave blacks the real ability to vote. It eliminated poll taxes. The 24th Amendment is in conjunction with it, and it forced the federal government to oversee fairness in voting in the South, and it's even today that the federal government can get involved and make sure that voting fairness is being practiced in all states. Thank you very much for the video. My students, now take those questions you just answered in blue and submit them to me, and I'll give you guys a grade. Have a good day.